Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. A mention of the mercy of your Lord to his servant, Zachariah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Live in London. I'm your host, Mohsin Shah. Previously, Sayyid Amar has been discussing different prophets throughout this Ramadan period. And those discussions are available on YouTube, Facebook, and small clips on Instagram as well. Please feel free to subscribe and to also catch up on those discussions. But inshallah, tonight we'll be discussing... Nabi Zechariah and Nabi Yahya. Who was Nabi Zechariah? And what relevance does he have to Ali Imran? And also Nabi Yahya, also known as John. What lessons can we learn from his life? And what sort of trials and tribulations did he go through? Inshallah, we'll discuss this and a lot more with Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidna. Wa alaikum as salam. How are you? Very well, thank you. How's your self? Ramadan period going? Alhamdulillah, we, we send. Our greetings to all the viewers and especially to our beloved Minhal Al Khafaji, Definitely, who's, who's been Iraq. presenting so well, and it's an honor to have you here tonight as well. Thank you very much. Pleasure Thank to you. be here. Sayyid Amar, if we go to the Quran, Surah 3, verse 33, Bismillah ar Rahim, surely Allah chose Adam and Nu and the descendants of Ibrahim and the descendants of Imran above the nations. Is, is this uh, an indication of, of the special families that have been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Fantastic you know, question. Al Imran, if you look within that eye of the Holy Quran, you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Inna Allah astafa Adam. Allah chose Adam. And we dissected Adam's life. Wa Nuh, and he chose Noah. Wa Ala Ibrahim, and the family of Ibrahim. And we looked at Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and Yusuf. But now there is an addition. Al Imran. Who are Al Imran? Imran is the grandfather <coughs> of Prophet Jesus. Salam. In English, his name is Joachim. Okay. Or Joachim. And he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imran was married to a lady whose name in the English language was Anna. And she had a sister by the name of Elizabeth who was married to Nabi Zakaria alayhi salam. So these two sisters chose well. Mashallah, both married to One prophets. chose Imran, mm -hmm. the other chose Zakaria. Mashallah. And what you had was, although they were both married to prophets of God, who were both very firm and upright servants of Allah. You know, they say that the name Joachim means somebody who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made firm. You need that istiqama. You need that chivalry, that uprightness. And that he had in abundance. But Anna and Elizabeth were both tested that they both couldn't have children. Anna and Jochim, Imran, couldn't have children. Elizabeth and her husband Zachariah could not have children. children. And therefore you found that this is the beginning of a wonderful story of Al Imran and the way Al Imran dedicate their children to the service of God. Because when Anna and Imran cannot have a child, they do something which we should do more in our communities. You see, you could never study the story of Nabi Yahya, Nabi Zakaria without understanding Al Imran. Al Imran, Al Ibrahim, these are 
family is mentioned with glory in the Quran. You have her making a nether or what we call a mannat. Yes. Sometimes people call it mannat, some call it a nether. And the whole idea of that is you make a vow to God. And that vow is that, Ya Allah, if you help me with my pregnancy and help me with my giving of birth and give me a child and bless me with a child, that child I will dedicate to your service. All of my rights as a parent and my doting love that I have is nothing compared to what I want my child to have towards you. Therefore, you found that Al Imran were facing this test, but decided that instead of complaining, why can't we have children? They began to talk to Allah. And the way they talked to Allah was by making a mannat or a nathar. Yes. So now if we look at Surah 3, verse 35, where it mentions about the mannat, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, when a woman of Imran said, My Lord, surely I vow to thee what is in my womb to be devoted to thy service. Except therefore for me, surely thou art the hearing, the knowing. I mean, making a mannat, uh, is this something that we should do? And furthermore, you know, we, we go to Ziyara, you see them tying strings and stuff. Are we going a bit too far ahead with making mannat? On the contrary, uh, making a nether or making a mannat is one of the most beautiful acts in the religion of Islam. Not only do we find the wife of a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making a nether in this particular moment, making a vow, but also we find that the Ahl al-Bayt would make vows as well. They would make a nether. Ahl al-Bayt if they make a mannat, then we follow their example. When Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein salam, when they were feeling unwell, didn't the Prophet tell Fatima al-Zahra and Imam Ali salam, <laughs> make a mannat, make a nether, that if they get better, you will fast for how many days? Yes. You will fast for three days. And the famous story when they fasted for three days, like me and you are fasting now mm -hmm. and starving. The famous story was that as they're breaking their fast, someone knocks at the door. Yes. First, it's someone who's needy, miskeen. They're about to break their fast. Someone's knocked at their door. They fulfilled their mannat. That Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, Ya Allah. This is a nether of shukr. If they feel better, we will fast for three days. First day someone knocks at the door. Oh, family of the Prophet, can you give me something to eat? They give everything they have. Next day, they're about to break their fast. Someone knocks at the door. Clearly, the food tasted good from that house. <laughs> and everybody knew. Next day, someone knocks at the door. I'm an orphan. First day, I'm a needy. Third day, I'm a prisoner. Each day, they gave away their meals for them. And the Quran revealed the famous... Verse in Surah 76, verse number 8, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا That we, they give away that food which they love to the needy, to the orphan, to the captive. Therefore, Ahl al-Bayt would tell us that make a mannat. And that's why we find that a nither or a mannat like the one which was done by the matriarch of Al Imran, can be three types. One is the nidr of shukr. Ya Allah, yes. if, uh, if you help my child, for example, find a job, then I will give 500 pounds to the community. Shukr mm -hmm. for your help. Yes. Then there is a nidr to remove bala. Mm -hmm. Ya Allah, I find that my child is far away from religion. This is a test mm. for me. Ya Allah, please with your guidance, guide my child. And I will help somebody go ziyara. Because you have removed that bala. That's the second type of nidr. Third type of nidr is when you make a vow to Allah. Ya Allah, I'm bad at fajr. Mm -hmm. But I make a mannat that if I, wake, if I don't wake up for fajr, I don't have breakfast. Why? Because I love breakfast. Mm -hmm. But I know that, listen, if I made a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah. then I've got to fulfill that vow. Because if you do not fulfill the mannat that you have made, 
Imran's wife said that what's in my womb is going to be dedicated to the service of God. Mm -hmm. In those days, you'd go to, you'd give your child to the temple of Herod. Okay. It's called the temple of Herod because obviously he recon rebuilt and reconstructed the temple. Mm -hmm. But by the temple mound, you got that temple of Herod and many of the Jewish families used to send their children to serve God. Whatever that child comes out, you're going to have to dedicate that child. Otherwise, there's a kafara to pay. Mm -hmm. A person cannot make a mannat and then not fulfill. If you now must say, Ya Allah, if you help me pass my exams, I'm going to give a thousand pounds to the community. And you don't give that thousand pounds, there's kafara you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Like a kafara when you miss a fast purposely. Yes. Likewise, there's a kafara for this. Yeah. So she had made a mannat. Whatever is my child's agenda, I'm going to ensure that that child. Now she was told that your child who we're granting you is going to cure the leper, cure the blind, raise the dead, make them yes. alive. So what's she thinking? It's a prophet, prophet who's a male. Yes. Allah planned otherwise. Yeah, because if we look at in um, Surah, th uh, verse, Surah 3 verse 36. So when she brought forth, she said, My Lord, surely I have brought it forth a female. And Allah, knows, Allah knew best what she brought forth. And the male is not like the female. And I have named it Maryam. And I commend her and her offspring into the protection from the accursed shaitan. Can you believe? She is thinking I'm definitely going to have a male. Allah grants her mm. a, a female. Yes. Issue number one. She's thinking, but Allah said that there's going to be a prophet born from my line. Mm -hmm. Allah didn't say that it's going to be your, it has to be your son. Mm -hmm. Secondly, males were known to be the ones who go and serve in the temple. Now what does she have? Female. female. Thirdly, she has made a nither, and that means that that nither has to be fulfilled. fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult, seemingly at the time. I do not want to say that there was no female representation in the temple, but not as many as the males. And this is normal. Even you'll find within the religion of Islam today, there's probably more male students in Qum than there are female. There's probably more male students in Najaf than there are female. There's probably more males who are given positions of authority than females. <coughs> that doesn't mean it's right, but this is a reality that has occurred sociologically in the path of many religions. One may ask the question, is this sexism? Mm. Now, why is it that you see that the male is to be seen as better than the female? No, she's thinking that, hold on, I thought it's a male child that I was going to have yes but Allah had planned otherwise that female that you're gonna have will be one of the four greatest females to have ever lived no doubt so you find therefore with that female with Maryam alayhi salam she becomes a blessing for their family saying you know they've made she's made a monetary that uh, I'm talking about Lady Anna that I will give my child into the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was this a common practice? Um, do, you mean, do, do you think it should be done today? Also, it's a female. I mean, at that time, were females put towards the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I, I think the mannat was a common practice. But I don't think females being servants in the temples was a common practice at all. But this female, Maryam, was extraordinary. And what about today? Do you think that maybe the Hausa and, and maybe even our you know, misogynistic um, approach to females in Islam. I mean, can, can females be mujtahid? Can, can they become maraja? Can they study to levels that males can in our community? There is an opinion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when choosing Maryam and purifying Maryam and choosing her above all the women, there is an opinion that Maryam was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, wow. Someone will say, but prophets can only be males. Who said prophets yeah, can only be oh. males? Now, I won't say that that's a majority opinion. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah astafa Adam wa Nuh, and he says, Inna Allah astafa ki, this choosing highlights that Allah doesn't just choose anyone. However, one may argue that there was a lady who was born after Maryam, who was greater than Maryam, and she was not yes. a prophet, and that is Fatima al Zahra oh, alayhi salam. Yes. But one thing we cannot deny, while she's in the temple of Herod, she gains an unbelievable amount of knowledge. 
Jibra'il visits her. Someone says, well, she has to be a prophet if Jibra'il visits her. I don't know if you definitely have to be a prophet for Jibra'il to visit you, but certainly you're up there in the highest ranks. So the misogyny that we sometimes have, the male chauvinistic attitude that can exist, we should never forget how Maryam broke all of this. And it seemed that with the children of Israel, especially this was prevalent. Now, can a female be a mujtahida? Of course, we have, we've had some great female mujtahidas. Yes, in the past, yeah. Can she be a marja? Well, why, she, why shouldn't she be a marja? You see, every marja is a mujtahid. Well, not every mujtahid is a marja. marja. Mm -hmm. But there are ulama out there, male maraja, who have said that there is no <coughs> harm if a lady has reached the highest level of studying Islamic law. And what is a marja? But a person who has achieved the highest of levels in uh, jurisprudence yes. and sharia mm -hmm. and the understanding mm -hmm. of all the other sciences, then why not? Why can a person not emulate somebody because of their gender? But these are all discussions that are ha being I mean, had at today, the moment. Today yeah. in the West, we do have female lawyers. We also have female judges. Correct. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an academic skill acquired. And if females have acquired that skill, I, I don't see any issue. Well, even if you look Quranically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is not scared or embarrassed one bit to discuss the beauty of the Queen of Sheba being mm -hmm. a lady in authority, but a lady of justice. Mm -hmm. um, there were men under her, but they revered her, they respected her. Um, it's not like Muslim countries haven't had female leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, Pakistan and Bangladesh will be the yeah. first to say that you think we're third world, at least we've had a female leader. There are some countries in the world you know very well um, mm -hmm. who are supposedly the most powerful and have never had a female president. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think this is an area which maybe needs reassessment. So the child is named Maryam or Mary in English. Mm. Uh, what, what's the root? What does it mean? Maryam, there's an opinion that it means servant of God. And no doubt there was no servant of God like her. And she required a guardian who could look after her when she entered the temple. Yes. So now we have Nabi Zakaria coming in, and, and mm. what was, um, I mean, why did he look after um, Jochim, the Prophet Jochim? No, Jochim had died. Mm -hmm. Jochim, Imran had died. Otherwise, Imran would have looked after his daughter. I see. He's a Nabi. Mm -hmm. He could have looked after his daughter. But Maryam had lost her parents. Therefore, when she had lost her parents, she required a guardian. When requiring a guardian, what happened was that in those days they would do a qur'ah, like we saw in the story of Nabi Yunus alayhi mm -hmm. yesterday, who's going to be the one of the, of the yes. ship. Likewise here yeah, they would do a qur'ah, and when they done this qur'ah, they wanted to see who would be the guardian of Maryam alayhi mm -hmm. And that's where we see Nabi Zakaria entering the fold. Okay. Because Nabi Zakaria alayhi salam, at this moment, when they pick out the name, they pick out his name. Mm -hmm. Now Nabi Zakaria, who's what? The brother-in-law yes. of Maryam's mom. Mm -hmm. Maryam is like, he's like the, the husband of her maternal aunt. Yes. Now he has the responsibility of looking after Maryam in the temple of Herod. And it's a big honor for him as well. MashaAllah. Um, so now if we go back to the Quran, yeah. uh, Surah 19 verse 5, And surely I fear my cousins after me, and my wife is barren. Therefore grant me from thyself an, an heir. heir. Yes. Nabi Zakaria, as we mentioned earlier, his wife Elizabeth could not have children. Anna... And Jochim couldn't have until they made the mandate. The mandate, and it was a female. What's interesting is that Nabi Zakaria and his wife, obviously it's a difficult time for them not having a child. It seems, Muhsin, from what you mentioned in the ayah, that he clearly says, I fear some sort of dissension within the family, that if I die and there's no heir to me, they're going to inherit the wealth and people with no consciousness of Allah, with no taqwa, are going to destroy the family if the wealth goes to them. Is it only the wealth to inherit? Can they inherit prophethood as well? You can't inherit prophethood. Oh, so it's just the wealth. Okay. Prophethood is based on a covenant with God. Mm -hmm. You can't inherit. Otherwise, Qabil can turn around now and say, I'm the son of Adam, I should have prophethood. prophethood which he said. Mm -hmm. When he fought Habil, yes? yes? In the famous story of Abel and Cain. 
This does not refer to prophethood. I want someone who is going to be inheriting the wealth of the family of Yaqub. Do prophets leave behind wealth? We saw in the story of Sulaiman and Dawood mm -hmm. yes. that prophets, السلام, they leave behind inherit what? They leave behind their inheritance mm -hmm. to their family yeah. members. Someone turned around and said, Prophets do not leave behind any wealth. What they leave behind is knowledge, their wealth is a sadaqah. Mm -hmm. That's a statement to indicate that the prophets aren't after this dunya. They're not concerned of leaving what? That I am going to get this much money and mm -hmm. amass this much wealth. Their concern is that they're going to give people their knowledge. However, when they have a certain amount of wealth, the Quran says, Kutiba alaykum hadara ahadakum al taraka khayran. That in your will, you must write down if there's a certain amount of money, you must write to who it goes. You must yes. allot this. Mm -hmm. So what? That applies to everybody, but doesn't apply to the Prophet of Allah SWT? Mm -hmm. This ayah was used by Fatima al Zahra mm -hmm. when they said that Fadak does not belong to her. Because the first Khalifa quoted a hadith that Prophet only belong. Who knows more in the world of hadith? Fatima who grew up in the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or those who used to worship idols. Nobody comes near the ilm of Fatima al-Zahra except her husband Imam Ali alayhi salam. Fatima al-Zahra said, did not the Quran said, wa waritha Sulaiman Dawood? Mm -hmm. Did not the Quran say that Yaqub wanted someone to inherit his wealth? Therefore, these examples, when the Ahl al-Bayt have given us the meaning of them, they highlight it's not that ya Nabi Zakaria alayhi salam wanted someone to inherit Nubuwa. No, Nabi Zakaria wanted somebody to inherit what? To inherit his wealth. Yeah. MashaAllah. Thank you, Sayyid. Now we're going to go to a break and inshallah we'll be continuing our discussion on Nabi Zakaria and then going on towards Nabi Yahya, inshallah. Join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. is a virtual university that works on a global scale to spread the true message of the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt's peace and blessings be upon them. Imam Hussain TV was established 10 years ago in the city of Isfahan, Iran. We work to cover all aspects of religion, Islamic jurisprudence, politics, philosophy and many more and aim to bring the public's attention to the righteous Islamic sect, Shia Islam. Our ultimate goal as a media group is to convey the interpretations of the Holy Qur'an as well as the traditions and knowledge of the Holy Prophet and his progeny may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. Our objectives are to protect and safeguard the Shia youth from the destructive impact of immoral ideologies, standing up against injustice by documenting the oppression of Shia across the globe as well as encouraging peace and unity amongst the Muslims. To reach our aims and serve the Muslim Ummah, we require a budget that would cover all the expenses for our productions, allowing us to work on different projects. Imam Hussein Media Group is a crowd-funded project. We have no sales nor do we charge for our services. We solely rely on monthly payments, financial contributions, donations, religious alms and generous gifts. The expenses of each production varies depending on the type of project and the style of filming. There are many elements to a production that requires time and capital. The producer must analyse the costs of the venue hire, equipment, transport, feature fees, set design, staff support and further additional costs. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, narrated the best of people is he from whom people benefit. It is up to you to help the Muslim Ummah come together and help guide the youth in remaining on the correct path of Islam. 
To take part in this global conquest and to spread the message of Imam Hussein, peace and blessings be upon him, please visit www.imamhussein3.tv or give us a call on plus 440203-515-0199. You can also contact us via WhatsApp, Telegram, SMS or even email us on donate at imamhussein.tv. Let's work together hand in hand to elevate the faith of our Shia youth today. Welcome back to Live in London where we're discussing Nabi Zakaria. Sayyidna, we were mentioning before about Mannat and we were asking about, you know, uh, we were talking about people going and praying and asking du'a from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Zakaria specifically goes towards the mihrab um, to, to ask for an heir. I mean, does time and, and, and place wherever you ask for du'a, does it actually have a significant impact on your du'a? Many people don't realize that there are certain spots on the earth where there is more energy than others. Even the energy of a certain area is a science now. That people look for places of positive energy. The color features, the water features, the stone features. We know very well that a person can gain energy in any area, but there's nothing like being next to the Kaaba. Why is looking at the Kaaba ibadah? Why is going all the way to Hajj compulsory within the religion of Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can tell us, read dua from where you are in London. I ask you, is the energy of Colindale the same energy as the energy of the Kaaba? Is the energy of Southall the same energy as that of the Kaaba? No, isn't it? Is the energy of Bradford the same energy as that of the Kaaba? We all pray in these areas, but there are certain areas where we know that in that spot, Fatima bint Asad gave birth to Ali. In that spot, Hajar is buried. In that spot, many prophets of God are in a semicircle buried. In that spot is where Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family used to walk, used to talk, used to sit. There are certain places, therefore, where a dua is accepted quicker than others. When people ask, why did Nabi Zakaria pray by the mihrab where Maryam was? That mihrab was a famous mihrab from the time of Nabi Dawood. And you find that in that mihrab, Maryam used to receive summer fruits in the winter. Oh, wow. And winter fruits when? In the summer. summer. <clears throat> Today, that's easy. If I want a gawafa or a papaya or a sweet watermelon, I can go to Whole Foods and I can have the best supply of fruits you'll ever see. <coughs> and I can find that today if I go to other supermarkets, the mm. summer fruits of Africa can be in front of me in winter. And the winter fruits can be in front of me in the summer. summer. But yes. in those days, there's no service where all of a sudden you want that fruit, it's right in front of you. Mm. When Nabi Zakaria saw this, he saw a number of things. Number one, Maryam is a sign of Allah. Where she is, that's to be honored. Number two, we also have a situation where I have seen the blessings of Jibra'il in that area. Number three, the fruits from Jannah are in that area. I have asked Allah. I am 120 years of age. And my wife Elizabeth is 98 years of age. All this time I have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I want an heir. Someone who will look after the inheritance of the family of Yaqub. Who will not corrupt it. Who will not destroy it. 
I can read a dua anywhere. But there is no dua like a dua which has had the energy of somebody who is a symbol of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. And that's why I remember being in Jannah al Baqi'ah. May Allah grant us and grant all of our listeners the ziyarah of Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam, Imam Zain Al Abideen, Imam Al Baqir, Imam Jafar Al Sadiq, and Umm Al Banin. May Allah grant all of us the ziyarah. When I was at Jannah Al Baqi'ah, you've got these four or five guards who are standing by Baqi'ah. They differ with us, obviously, in ideology. They think that when we come by the graves of the grandsons of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, that we're committing shirk or that this is a bid'ah. We clearly are saying, أَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ قَدْ أَقَمْتَ الصَّلَاةِ أَتَيْتَ الزَّكَاةِ أَمَرْزَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ نَعِيْتَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ أَطَعْتَ اللَّهِ You obeyed Allah. But they say, from the teachings, from the time of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah and others who say that the Shia and the Sufis and all of these are all heretics. So they say that we're all heretics. They say to us, why do you come here near these graves to read a dua? This fundamental. Why? What difference will it make? You go to Karbala, what difference does it make? You go to Sham, what difference does it make? You go to Meshad, what difference does it make? They don't realize where a prophet sat, where a miracle took place, where one of the awliya or one of their imma was, has an energy reverberating around it the way Allah symbolically highlighted the energy of the Kaaba or the energy of the Mihrab of Maryam. When Zakaria went and sat at that Mihrab, he was highlighting to us there are certain places the dua, the email of the dua gets quicker because the Wi Fi is better in that area. You know when I'm looking for Wi-Fi. Good Some places <laughs> where I'm going looking for Wi-Fi, I can't get any Wi-Fi. In Arbain especially, yeah. I go to <laughs> another part of the house, I see that there's Wi-Fi. I go to another part, there's brilliant Wi-Fi. When Zakaria wanted a child, he wanted a child, he was reading dua constantly. When he read by the mihrab, he set a lesson for us. What was that lesson? Is that a dua in certain places. And that's why, why do people go on ziyarah? Why? Why they go to Karbala on the 15th of Sha'ban? Why do they go to Karbala on the day of Arafah? Why do they go to Karbala on the Arba'een of Imam Al-Hussein? Because they know that the dua is mustajab under the Qubba of Abi Abdullah Al-Hussein and by the Dhariq of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam. Therefore when people ask why did Nabi Zakaria alayhi salam pray by the Mihrab of Maryam? It was setting a message there are places on this earth where my servants have sat where your email of your dua will reach quicker and will be answered quicker. Asanted. Sayyidna, Nabi Zakaria's mashallah, his dua was answered and he was granted a son. And we go to the Quran, Surah 19, verse 7. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. O Zakaria, indeed we give you good tidings of a boy whose name will be John. We have not assigned to any before this name. So, Nabi Yahya was the first person to be named Yahya? Yes. Yahya was the first to be given that name by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Christians may refer to him as Yohana. Okay. Others will say John. John. And is this the same John as in the Bible, uh, the Gospel of John? No. That's John of Zebedee. Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke and John, John that's yes. different. Mm -hmm. Some people said, look, there may be people called Yahya at that time. The Quran is contradictory because there are others who are given the name John. The name Yahya given was the first name given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to someone that name Yahya. Yes, okay. someone's mom might have named him Yahya. Someone's dad over there might have named him Yahya. Nobody had Allah naming them Yahya. Oh. This was a distinct honor that nobody had been given this name to Yahya except it was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. Say that if we carry on with the surah, we go to ayah 12. Oh Allah, <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah said, Oh John, take the scriptures with determination and we have give him judgment while yet a boy. So, you know, is, is Nabi Yahya quite young? And are, are we used to seeing prophets being very, very young? Maybe, uh, you know... Uh, ya Yahya, khud al-kitab bi 
وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيَّةِ Oh, Yahya, take the book and teach it with strength. The book of Musa, alayhi salam. Torah. And we have given him wisdom and authority while a child. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not ageist. We are. There's sexist, there's racist, there's ageist. ageist. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not ageist. We, the Arabs, and many Muslims are ageist. They discriminate according to age. If you're younger than them but more knowledgeable, they won't listen to you because they can't take it. You have to look older than them. If you want to reach a position but there's someone older than you, they prefer someone older than you than the younger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said, وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ sabiya, He's saying that we choose who we want to give Nubuwa to. It could be a Nabi who's five or a Nabi who's 40. Nabi Yahya from a young age, unique. Other kids are playing. He says, how can I play when there is a Sarat? When there's a day of judgment I have to answer. Other kids want to go and play. He wants to go and learn. Other kids want to play. He wants to go to the temple and serve. Mm -hmm. He's begging his mom. Mom, please. I want to go to the temple. I want to gain ilm. And I want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his mom would see him crying. Why are you crying? I cry because I remember the bounties of my Lord. I cry because I remember there's a day of judgment. There's a day we have to answer our Lord. Nabi Yahya was something else. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I ask you, if he wants to give someone hikmah mm -hmm. at that young age, then Allah will give that hikmah. Yahya was a miracle. A miracle firstly because his parents were at a very yes, old age. Indeed. A miracle secondly because his father Allah gave him a sign that for three days you won't speak. Then you'll know that you're going to have that son. A miracle thirdly because he had wisdom profound at that young age. Was this used by any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt? Exactly. Yes it was. Because when Imam Al-Jawad became an Imam. Imam al-Jawad became an imam at which age? He became an imam at the age of nine. Nine, mashallah. People would give dirty looks. <laughs> One person tried to give a dirty look to Imam al-Jawad. Imam al-Jawad straight away replied to him, Did Allah not give wisdom to Yahya when he was a child? Mm -hmm. So why do you doubt that Allah could give me? If Allah wants to, there are anbiya, he made prophets at 40. Mm -hmm. But some he made prophets at 13, like Salih and Sulaiman. Mm -hmm. Likewise with Nabi Yahya, Allah gave him authority and wisdom at a very young age. Nabi Yahya السلام, from that young age had mastered the Torah. Nobody could come near him in knowledge. Nabi Yahya السلام, had mastered the Torah. He was very beloved to his mom. His mom, you know, gave birth to him six month pregnancy. Mashallah. Allah named him Yahya. But his mom was like, Ya Allah, you've given me this child, but the child's always sad. And he's like, Mom, I'm not sad. I'm honored, but I remember Allah SWT and the bounties Allah has given me makes me cry. So if Allah wants to, he can appoint his prophets, as we will see tomorrow in the show. Prophet Jesus was a prophet uh, from which age? Infancy. Prophet. Infancy! Yeah. Why then when Imam Ali was going to be the Khalifa, did they say that Imam Ali is only 33, there are people older than him? Baba, we believe in Yahya. وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيَّةً When Imam Ali was on the day of Ghadir was 33, Nabi Yahya was still not even in his teens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants to give Nabi Yahya wisdom at that young age, the gate to the city of knowledge does not have that wisdom. The one who the Prophet chewed his food and fed him mm -hmm. and taught him everything that's opened thousands of doors does not have that knowledge. It's absurd when you hear, sadly, that after Saqifa, you have people saying that Ali cannot be a leader because he's too young. What do you mean too young? Islam, we don't have too young. Therefore, Nabi Yahya, from a young age, was given immense wisdom and authority. 
Yes. Sayyidina. Nabi Yahya, mashallah, miraculous birth and, and, and with um, the, the du'as of his father, uh, Nabi Zakaria. And if we go to the Quran, uh, Surah 19, Ayah 15. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And peace be upon him the day he was born and the day he dies and the day he is raised alive. Is this some sort of indication to the birthdays and the mawlids that we have of the prophets and the imams? Or is this just... Peace be upon him the day he is born. Mm -hmm. And people say you shouldn't remember the birthdays of the prophets. These are all bid'ah, innovations. If Allah is saying salam on him the day he is born, then this highlights that the day of his birth was a barakah. And it was a day of rizq for all of us. Therefore, if it is salam alayhi O mawulida salams be on him the day he is born, then how about the day that Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, was born? The biggest sadness in the Muslim world is the people who do not celebrate the mawlid. Of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. I remember there are people out there who say, You Shia do not respect the Prophet. You think Ali is the Prophet. You don't talk about the Prophet a lot. We never forget the Mawlud of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And we don't forget the Shahada of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I defy you to show me a community in the Muslim world who when it comes to Rabi al awwal or comes to Safar, remembers the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, like we do. Not just Wilad, Shahada as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need to say, if the day of his birth is not important, why say salamun alayhi yawma walida? Because those days are the days where there is an increase in barakah. There is a fadl on us mankind. There is a ni'mah on us, the birth of this personality. Therefore, this nonsense that celebrating the day of the birth is a bid'ah, on the contrary, we remember these lines in particular. Yeah. Insightful, Sayyid. Sayyid, you know, we've had discussions beforehand on, on you know, um, people being married and also relationships and also sex. With looking at Nabi Yahya, he has a very celibate life. And we know from Christianity as well, you know, they, men and women, especially uh, priests and nuns, they like to marry themselves to God uh, and, and have a celibate life as well. Can, is this like, you know, similar to Islam? Do we have a similar approach? I've always wondered about celibacy. I have some friends who are in the priesthood who are wonderful human beings. And when I ask them about celibacy, they say that we devote all our energy towards the Lord. Now the church has been rocked with scandals of pedophilia, of child sex mm -hmm. abuse. Whether that can be directly related to this celibacy which they see in John the Baptist or they see in Christ, whether we can generalize like that or no, I prefer not to generalize, but certainly, if John the Baptist was celibate, that's John the Baptist. <laughs> you know, um, Nabi Yahya alayhi salam being celibate, that's made for him in particular that he's able to, and he didn't live long on this earth before he was sadly martyred. In terms of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, who's our greatest role model, and I'd say, 99% of the prophets, they've all got married and got kids. Sometimes even more than one wife. Sometimes more than one wife. And I think when the prophet, peace be upon his family, sees this trend, where some of his own companions start staying away from sex and perfume and mm. meat, thinking that religiosity is if you stay away from the desires of the dunya, and you stay away from sex and perfume and meat, this is a sign of you being holy. And he scolded them. He said, I go to my wives, mm -hmm. I eat meat, and I perfume myself. <clears throat> now, it's surprising when somebody says that I'm going to live a life without having a son when the God of the religion is meant to have had one son. <laughs> you know, um, I find that very interesting that there are people out there who are like, you know, I don't want to have a family and I want to devote myself to God. But God supposedly in Christianity decided to send his only son. So even God had some sort of relation, supposedly. But in Islam, <coughs> celibacy is no way encouraged. There was a time when there were people who would come 
to the Imams and there were ladies who would say that I want to stay away from getting married, I just want to serve God and study. Mm -hmm. And the Imams reply, if this was the best way then Fatima, daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa would not have gotten married, true? true. But did she get married? Yes. Indeed. Did she have children? Indeed. Yes. Did she become the best worshipper? Indeed. So even there are those in certain Islamic spiritual circles, when they refer to some mystics in those circles, they say that that female mystic stayed away from marriage. They'll mention, for example, I think Rabi al adawiyah and others. And they say that they stayed away from marriage. Our greatest role models in the female is Fatima al-Zahra And the greatest in the males is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And while they got married, that's a lesson for all of us. And the Prophet himself would say, النكاح من سنتي فمن رغب عن سنتي فليس مني نكاح is from my sunnah. Whoever stays away from my sunnah is not one of me. When we have this khutbah in our mosques, this khutbah is making clear celibacy is not something encouraged. People actually think, you would you be surprised, there are people who think Islam is anti-sex. Islam is one of the religions that promotes sex the most. Indeed. Yeah, culture-wise, I'd leave that for another discussion. But the religion itself promotes sex. However, there are boundaries. But the extreme of one side of celibacy and the extreme of the other side where you just have sex with anybody without there being any questions, Islam doesn't promote that. There are relationships to be had. There is sexual intercourse to be had. Celibacy is certainly not something encouraged. If it happened with Nabi Yahya, Nabi Yahya <coughs> in that period chose a particular godly way, but that doesn't make it the norm. Yes. Sayyidina, you were mentioning uh, Nabi Yahya having a very ascetic lifestyle. He didn't want to play with toys, wasn't very materialistic. On the other hand, we have prophets like David and Solomon who had palaces and big temples. What's the right way? It's an interesting question because you'll find when someone wants to start becoming very religious, they're like, I don't want to be someone of the dunya. I don't <laughs> want to have a nice house. Dawood had a nice house. I don't want to have a nice car. You should see the horses in the story of Sulaiman. He loved his horses and he was stroking them from how much he loved them. There's a, there's a balance that's needed. One thing about Dawood or Yahya. Dawood was the richest. Yahya was the poorest. If you put them in their own times, they would have behaved the same. Mm -hmm. In your own time, you judge. If there's a lot of poverty in your time, you hold back. But if everybody is doing well economically, then you're able to learn. Allah subhanahu wa never said, I want all of you to be equal. There's no such idea that all of you should be on the same wage. I have blessed some with certain parts of rizq. Others I'm testing. I've tested those people for some parts of their life. They'll have a test later. Those guys will have it easier later. Mm -hmm. But it's all about achieving a balance. Live in this world, but don't let the world live in you. You know, there are people when it comes to donations to the mosque, He's got a Ferrari, but he just about donates. <laughs> and they ask, how do I know if I'm a person of the dunya? If you can donate as much as you've bought that Ferrari to your mosque, then mm -hmm. you by all means have that Ferrari. But if you're somebody who's thinking a million times about donations, but when it comes to cars, you can give so much away, that's when you begin to reassess. Therefore, Allah did not say a person cannot live in a big house, otherwise Sulaiman's house is problematic. Mm -hmm. Nor did Allah subhanahu say you all have to live as... As ascetic as Yahya alayhi salam, try and find a healthy balance. Yeah. Sayyidina, Nabi Yahya is known as John the Baptist in the Bible. As Muslims, do we believe in baptism? Do we believe in this, uh, this ritual of ablution that brings you into a religion? Well, the ritual of ablution and the way that baptism is done in the churches is not something we believe in. We believe in it metaphorically. Mm -hmm. There's an ayah in the Quran in Surah 2 verse 138, Sibrat Allah. The subh of Allah, the coloring of Allah. Mm -hmm. So true. The painting of Allah, the colors of Allah, and who better to color us than Allah? Who bet the baptism of Allah, and who better to baptize us than Allah? Allah. Not literally, Allah colors me. I don't need to get a dye and mix it with water mm -hmm. and sprinkle it on a baby's head. No. Metaphorically. The color of Allah is truthfulness. The color of Allah is taqwa. The color of Allah is humility. Therefore, if somebody asks, do we believe in baptism? We believe in a metaphorical baptism. 
صبغة الله ومن أحسن من الله صبغة in Surah Al-Baqarah highlights that there is a baptism but it's where we ask Allah Ya Allah paint me or decorate is a better word mm-hmm. decorate me with your generosity decorate me with your knowledge decorate me with your honor that type of baptism and decoration we agree on metaphorically but literally no we don't believe in it yeah we don't believe in the sprinkling of water on somebody <laughs> and with john the baptist nabi yahya do we as muslims believe his sole purpose was to foretell the coming of hazrat isa alayhi salam no or? no his purpose was to teach the torah of moses he does, of course, like any prophet would do, tell you who's coming after him. Mm-hmm. 20 years after him comes Nabi Isa alayhi salam. <clears throat> and there are many traditions about him talking about Nabi Isa. But do we believe that John the Baptist's sole role was to tell people that the only son of God's going to come, he's going to save all of you and he's going to be crucified? We don't believe that at all. Yeah. With Nabi Yahya, I believe he had a very tragic, you could say, Gruesome, barbaric death or martyrdom. Could you please explain what happened? I think Nabi Yahya and Nabi Zakaria, both of them I think are martyrs. I certainly know that Nabi Yahya is a martyr from the traditions. And there are some that indicate even Nabi Zakaria was sought to death while hiding in a tree from a mob who wanted to kill him. Now Nabi Yahya, John the Baptist, has many similarities to Imam Al-Husayn alayhi salam. I will show you how. John the Baptist, while he was living, there was a king who wanted to marry the, some say his stepdaughter. Some say his wife's niece. At the time, for the children of Israel, this was something which was not allowed. It was prohibited. Now the king seen this girl and he's like, she's so beautiful, but she's related to my missus in a way where I can't marry her. He knew that nobody had the kitab of Moses and the laws of Moses like John, Nabi Yahya alayhi salam. So he would come to Nabi Yahya alayhi salam. He asked him, he said, listen, my wife has got a daughter from her first marriage. I want to marry her. And the traditions differ exactly on the details. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam turned around to me and said, you can't. I said to him, why? He said to him, because in the laws of God, this is not allowed. He said, is there no loophole? Mm. You know, is it like, find me a loophole. Why don't people go to Maulana as an accountant? Yeah. Loopholes. Loopholes, yes. You go to a Maulana when you want a loophole. <coughs> and you go to an accountant when you want a loophole. loophole. So he came to me and said, is there no loophole? Come on, I beg you, give me a loophole. He said, no, there isn't. His wife wanted this to take place, the marriage, because it would look after her future and her family's future. She came to him, she said, what happened? He's like, you know, I tried, but it didn't work out. She's like, what do you mean it didn't work out? You're the king. Not everything should work out for you. What do you mean it didn't work out? He's like, you know, I asked him. But the reply was that it's not allowed. She's like, ask him again. So he came to Nabi Yahya again. I beg you, is there a loophole? Is there anything that we can do? Again, nothing. Okay. One day, she got the king drunk. And she got the girl to come out in her finest regalia. The, ju- the king sees her and she's virtually wearing nothing. The king's besotted by her. So the king comes up to her. Wants to touch her, she's like, no. His wife says, you want to touch her? You behead Yahya. He's like, what do you mean behead Yahya? She's like, you get Yahya's head. You behead Yahya and you bring the head to Sham. In the palace, you put the head. Only then you can have this girl. He's like, but Yahya is a prophet of God. He's a sign of God. Mm -hmm. Allah named him. No. You know what he did? He told his soldiers, get Yahya. They bought Nabi Yahya. He said, I want to marry this girl. He said, you can't got the sword beheaded Nabi Yahya when he beheaded Nabi Yahya alayhi salam 
he was able at that moment to marry that girl. Subhanallah, like the story of the she camel of Saleh, mm -hmm. how the person was told by his girlfriend, listen, you want me? You kill the camel. Like Ibn Muljam when Qutam mm -hmm. said, you yes, want yes. me? You kill Ali ibn Abi Talib. Subhanallah, sometimes sexual energy can destroy society, can ruin a society. If there is no consciousness of a day of resurrection and accountability, mm -hmm. you can destroy society. You know what he did? He got the head of Nabi Yahya. And he put it in his palace in Sham. I ask you, Muhsin, you've been ziyarah to Sham. I have. Have you been to the Umayyad palace? I have. Who's buried inside? Nabi? No, Yahya? Yeah, yeah. Alayhi yes. Eventually, when somebody does this, the Quran says, you will avenge the oppressors. Don't worry about us. Mm -hmm. We'll get them. Nebuchad Nazar, eventually when he comes into power, absolutely annihilates this man. Look at the similarities with Imam al Hussein. Yes. You know, Nabi Zakaria loved Imam al Hussein. Mm -hmm. Nabi Zakaria, when he read a dua, said, Bihaq al Hussein. In the name of that martyr, because he was told the story of Imam al-Hussein. Mm -hmm. And you know, people always try and say that Kaf Ha Ya Ain Saad refers in a way to Karbala, mm -hmm. you know, those letters. Yes. You know, we don't need to go to those interpretations, but what we have is hadith mm -hmm. that says that Nabi Zakaria loved Imam al-Hussein. And he brought up Nabi Yahya with the love of Imam al-Hussein. Imam Zain al abidin says, on our way to Karbala, my father, Imam al Hussein, would always mention Nabi Yahya. I wondered why. Only when we got to Sham, I realized mm -hmm. why. Because you know, Ziyarat al Arba'in no. of Imam al Hussein includes that you died in the same way Yahya died. Now mm -hmm. look, Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, Allah named him. Who named Imam al Hussein? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam was born after six months pregnancy. Imam al Hussein was born after six eight? Month, six months pregnancy. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam was killed by the emperor of his time. Mm -hmm. Imam al Hussein was killed by who? The emperor of his time. What was his name? Yazid al Nabi Yahya alayhi salam was beheaded. Imam al Hussein was? Beheaded. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam's head was taken to Sham. Imam al Hussein's head was taken to? Sham. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, his head was paraded to everybody on a gold tray in Sham. Imam Hussein was? On a spear. And on a gold tray in mm -hmm. Sham. Sham. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam's killer was avenged by Nabushad Nazar. And you found Mukhtar al-Thaqafi shortly after Karbala. Within five years, avenged the killing of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Therefore, when we read Ziyarat al-Arba'in of Imam Hussein, and may Allah bless all of our viewers, in the name of Amir al muminin martyred on these nights, and in the name and the holy night that is Laylat al Qadr, bless us with Ziyarat al Arba'in. In Ziyarat al Arba'in, you will come to that line that you, O oh Imam al Hussein, went through what Nabi Yahya had gone through before you. Therefore, Nabi Zakaria and Nabi Yahya had taught us a lesson in this world. Success and victory comes through love of Muhammad and Al Muhammad and remembrance of Hussein alayhi salam. We as a channel are honored that we're called Imam Al Hussein TV because we remember Abu Abdullah. But before us, the NBA, mm -hmm. like Nabi Zakaria, like Nabi Yahya, were all lovers of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam without having even met Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. And if anybody uttered those lines, Ya Laytana Kunna Ma'akum. It would be these two prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. Very insightful. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Sayyidina, final point to the viewers. Uh, maybe something on the life of... Uh, yeah, to inspire uh, from the life of uh, Nabi Zakaria and Nabi Yahya, inshallah. The beauty, the beauty of this father-son relationship, the beauty of dua. Mm -hmm. Never doubt what Allah can do for you. And so. never doubt making a mannat or a nidhar. Because at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always be there for you.
Masha, thank you very much. Sayyid, and thank God you to all our viewers well. for joining us. Uh, we appreciate and we thank all our viewers for joining us and all the comments that you've been sending. Inshallah, we'll have a new discussion tomorrow with Sayyid Amar on another Prophet, Inshallah. Until then, remember to Jesus, us. Inshallah. Inshallah. Tomorrow. Oh, mashallah. Jesus. Nabi Isa alayhi salam inshallah tomorrow. Uh, please remember us in your du'as and, and have a uh, lovely fast and remember us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.